is from Psalm 100. Know ye that the Lord, he is God. It is he that hath made us, and not we ourselves. We are his people, and the sheep of his pasture. Enter into his gates with thanksgiving, and into his courts with praise. Be thankful unto him, and bless his name. For the Lord is good, his mercy is everlasting, and his truth endureth to all generations. Let's ask God's blessing on our worship in silent prayer. Our help is in the name of Jehovah, who made heaven and earth. Beloved in our Lord Jesus Christ, grace, mercy, and peace be granted unto you from God our Father, through Jesus Christ our Lord, by the operation of the Holy Spirit. Amen. We sing from Psalter 409. 409, the five stanzas, hallelujah, hallelujah, in his temple, God be praised. And we remain standing after this for the Apostles' Creed.
confess together our Catholic, undoubted Christian faith. I believe in God the Father, Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only begotten Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried, he descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit. I believe on Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. We sing from Psalter 79. Psalter 79, the three stanzas. <laughs> Let us worship God in prayer. Our Father in heaven, we come into thy holy presence because thou alone art the one true and living God, the maker of heaven and earth the one who by thyself hast stretched out the heavens and filled the earth with all kinds of life. And thou hast given unto us also life and breath and all things. And as we have sung that everything that hath breath must praise thee, the Lord so with our breath this morning, we praise thee, our God and heavenly Father. We thank thee, O Father in heaven, that thou hast given to us the Lord's day, one day set aside each week at the beginning of a new week in which we especially come together for public worship to gather together as a body of believers, confessing 
one faith in Jesus Christ, thy Son. Fellowshipping with one another and loving one another with a pure heart fervently. We thank thee for Jesus Christ. He is the reason why we can come together. Because without a mediator who reconciled us unto thee, we could never come into thy presence. We could never approach thee. We would always flee from thee. And yet, by the blood of Jesus Christ, we who were afar off have been brought nigh. We thank thee that we hear about Jesus Christ in the preaching. Not only do we hear about him in the preaching, but we hear him in the preaching. We hear his voice. He is the good shepherd, and we are the sheep of his pasture, and so we look forward to hearing his voice as he speaks to us in a special way in the preaching of the gospel. We thank thee that thou hast given to us a pastor, a servant of Jesus Christ, a weak vessel in which thou hast placed the glorious gospel of thy Son, so that the glory and power of the gospel might not be in the instrument who brings that gospel to us, but the glory and power of that gospel might be in thee and in thy Son, Jesus Christ. And may our pastor take those riches, the unsearchable riches of Jesus Christ, which he has studied in this past week, and may he bring them before us so that we and our children are able to understand them, are able to appreciate them and receive them and rejoice in them. And may he add nothing of his own which would only detract from those riches, but may he simply present them as they are set forth in Holy Scripture, which is thy word, thy word which is truth. We thank thee that thy truth endures to all generations. Although the wicked world despises thy truth, and seeks to corrupt it, and to bury it, and to destroy it. Yet thy truth continues. Thy truth is unassailable. And those who seek to destroy thy truth will be destroyed. Or if thou hast mercy, thou wilt turn them from that wickedness and reveal that truth to them as thou didst many years ago reveal that truth to the Apostle Paul, who was seeking to destroy it. And so we confess, O Father, that thou art good, that thou art glorious, that thou art the almighty God, that thou art righteous and holy, and a God of great mercy and compassion and grace and love, to thy people in Jesus Christ. We thank thee too for the sacrament of the Holy Supper, which is set before us this morning, so that we can see with our eyes and we can taste with our mouths the gospel of Jesus Christ, so that we can see the bread broken, and the wine poured out as a sure sign of the finished work of Jesus in which he was broken on the cross and his blood was shed for the pardon of our sins. 
We thank thee that we can take that bread and we can eat it, and we can take that wine and drink it so that it becomes part of us, so that we can also see in a wonderful way how we have this union with our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. A union which is not static, but a union which is living, so that we grow up into Jesus Christ, and we more and more are conformed to his image as his Spirit sanctifies us by thy grace. These great works of thine, O Father, are mysterious. They are wonderful, and we need the holy sacrament as a sign and seal of these things because we are so weak in our faith that we cannot understand them and receive them as we ought. But we thank thee, O Father, that thou hast been pleased in thy mercy to come to us in our weakness and show us in a special way the wonderful gospel of our Savior, Jesus Christ. We thank thee for our congregation. We thank thee for those who are the members here, those who are the communicant members, those who are baptized members. We pray for each one that thou wilt give unto him or her what he or she needs, truly needs, and we know that thou knowest our needs more than we know them, that thou art perfectly wise and good, and dost supply the needs of thy people. We pray for those with particular trials in the congregation. We remember the boons and Raj Brands as they have suffered bereavement in this past week. We pray comfort them, comfort their family members who are mourning the loss of a loved one. Grant that their hearts might be healed and that the balm of the gospel might be a means to strengthen their hearts at this difficult time. We remember also the calls as Jason's sister is near unto death, Liz Call. We pray for her as she prepares to take that journey through death, which is a passageway into everlasting life. We pray that thou wilt sustain her and also comfort her family as they prepare to see her leave them. And we thank thee that she, as she passes into glory, will go into a place where there is no more crying or pain or suffering and where there is blessed and perfect fellowship with Jesus Christ. Bless and comfort the calls at this time and others who have been recently bereaved as well. We thank thee, O Father, that we are members of one body, that we are privileged to bear one another's burdens, so that when one member of the body suffers, all the members of the body suffer with it. And when one member of the body is exalted and glorified, all the members of the body rejoice with that one member. May we be united together in the bonds of peace and love. And we pray, O Father, forgive our sins, our sins against thee and our sins against one another. And if we are holding on to sins, we pray, give us thy grace to repent of those sins, to change our mind concerning those sins and to put those sins away from us, especially those who are going to partake of the supper of our Lord Jesus Christ. Bless the preaching of thy word. Bless the remainder of this worship service. May it bring glory and honor unto thee alone. For 
Christ's sake. Amen. We worship God with our offering. Our first offering will be for the general fund. We sing from Psalter 20, Psalter 20, the third stanza says, The Lord is most righteous. The Lord loves the right. Let's sing the three stanzas of 20.
We turn in God's Word to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Second Corinthians chapter five. For we know that if our earthly house of this tabernacle were dissolved, we have a building of God and house not made with hands eternal in the heavens. For in this we groan, earnestly desiring to be clothed upon with our house which is from heaven, if so be that being clothed we shall not be found naked. For we that are in this tabernacle do groan, being burdened, not for that we would be unclothed, but clothed upon, that mortality might be swallowed up of life. Now he that hath wrought us for the selfsame thing is God, who also hath given unto us the earnest of the Spirit. Therefore we are always confident, knowing that whilst we are at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord, for we walk by faith, not by sight. We are confident, I say, and willing rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. Wherefore we labor that, whether present or absent, we may be accepted of him. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that every one may receive the things done in his body according to to that he hath done, whether it be good or bad. Knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men, but we are made manifest unto God, and I trust also are made manifest in your consciences. For we commend not ourselves again unto you, but give you occasion to glory on our behalf, that ye may have somewhat to answer them which glory in appearance and not in heart. For whether we be beside ourselves, it is to God, or whether we be sober, it is for your cause. For the love of Christ constraineth us, because we thus judge that if one died for all, then we're all dead." And he, and that he died for all, that they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves, but unto him which died for them and rose again. Wherefore, henceforth know we no man after the flesh. Yea, though we have known Christ after the flesh, yet now henceforth know we him no more. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. And all things are of God, who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ, and hath given to us the ministry of reconciliation. To wit, that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. Now then we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God did beseech you by us, we pray you in Christ's stead, be ye reconciled to God. For he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we 
might be made the righteousness of God in him. Thus far, we read God's holy word. Our text is the last verse, verse 21. For he hath made him to be sin for us, who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Beloved, the subject or theme of 2 Corinthians 5, especially the second part of the chapter, is reconciliation. And reconciliation is the work of bringing together parties at variance with one another. In reconciliation, there is often a guilty party, the offender. There is an innocent party party, the offended, and then there is a mediator who seeks to reconcile those two parties together. Reconciliation. In this chapter, though, the subject is not reconciliation of friends who have fallen out with one another, or spouses whose marriage is in difficulties, or nations who are on the verge of war. But the subject here is reconciliation of God and sinners. And in the context, the apostle describes God's work of reconciliation. Sinners are the guilty party, the offenders. God, as it were, is the innocent party. He is the offended. And Christ is the mediator. He reconciles us to God. And verse 19 tells us what God has done. Verse 19, God, who is the offended party, was in Christ, who is the mediator, reconciling the world, the offenders, the world, unto himself, not imputing their trespasses or their offenses unto them. And so we have here the basis of reconciliation. It is the work of Christ. And we have here the essence of reconciliation, which is the non-imputation of sin. And that reconciliation then was purchased some 2,000 years ago on the cross. And that must then be applied to us in time. And this application happens, says the apostle, through the ministry of reconciliation. At the end of verse 18, it says, and hath given to us the ministry of reconciliation. And the end of verse 19, hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. And that word or ministry of reconciliation is the preaching of the gospel, which is God's means then of realizing in the lives of his people the reconciliation which Christ accomplished on the cross. And the gospel then includes a call. Be ye reconciled to God. And when elect sinners hear that call, be ye reconciled to God, The Holy Spirit takes that gospel, applies that gospel to the hearts of God's people, causes them to repent and believe, and through faith, that purchased reconciliation is applied. And then our text, verse 21, gives a reason for this call. Verse 20 ends this way, Be ye reconciled 
to God. And here's the reason for or because, because God has done something wonderful so that we might be reconciled to him. Notice then the sinless son made sin for us. The sinless son made sin for us. Notice first the great contrast, then the great exchange, and third, the great benefit. If you analyze verse 21, there are three parties mentioned in that verse. Notice how they are described. First, there is a party called him who knew no sin. That's a, clearly a sinless, perfectly righteous, holy person. Then there's a second party called us or we. For us, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. And then third, there's a party called he. He hath made. He's the one doing the action of the text. And then work backwards, you can identify who these three parties are. First, he is God. Be ye reconciled to God, verse 20 says, for he, God, did this wonderful thing. Second, the we or the us, well, that's the sinner, the believer, who is reconciled to God. It was for us, for our sake, that God performed the action in the text. And then third, the him who knew no sin is Jesus Christ. So God did something to Jesus Christ for us, and the thing that God did to Jesus Christ for us accomplishes reconciliation. And thus the call comes to us, be ye reconciled to God because of what God has done. And thus we have here the gospel in miniature, the gospel summarized in one verse. We learn what God has done in Jesus Christ for our salvation. And the first thing we learn here is something about Jesus Christ himself. He's not named. He's described this way. Him who knew no sin. We know what sin is. Sin is something evil. Sin is something wicked. Sin is that thing that is opposed to the holy God. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Romans 3, verse 23. It's a missing of the mark. We all understand that. It's a refusal of the sinner to direct his life to the mark or the goal of the glory of God. It's rebellion against God transgression of God's commandments. Sin is, I shall to God's, thou shalt not. Sin is our art. Sin is a corruption of our nature. Sin is depravity of the flesh. Canons 341 speak this way about sin. Blindness of mind, horrible darkness, Vanity, perverseness of judgment. And again, wicked, rebellious, obdurate, or stubborn in heart and will, impure in our affections. What the apostle says here about Jesus, he knew no sin. And that's a striking way to describe the perfect holiness and righteousness of the Son of God. In fact, it is much stronger than any other expression in Scripture 
describing the perfect holiness of Jesus. John 8, 46 says this, Jesus challenges his enemies. Which of you convinceth me of sin? So Christ there is saying to his enemies, which of you can convict me of sin so as to prove me guilty of sin? And of course, the answer is no one. No one answers this challenge because no one can. Then Hebrews 4.15 says, Jesus was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. Hebrews 7.26 says that Jesus is holy, undefiled, and separate from sinners. 1 Peter 1.19 calls Jesus without blemish and without spot. And 1 Peter 2.22 says about Jesus, who did no sin, neither was guile found in his mouth. Abundant evidence, therefore, for the perfect holiness and righteousness of Jesus Christ. But our text goes further and says, he knew no sin. And that describes then his relationship to sin. What is the relationship of Jesus to sin? He knew no sin. And that means then, as to its nature and its practice, sin is completely foreign to Jesus. He does not know it. He knew it not. Sin is completely foreign to Jesus. He knew no sin in heaven, of course, it was utterly beyond his personal experience. And then Jesus comes into our world in the incarnation, takes upon himself a human nature consisting of a human body and a human soul, and he still knew no sin. Sin remained beyond his personal experience. And then Jesus was tempted of the devil, and even though the devil tried to cause Jesus to sin, Jesus still knew no sin. It was beyond his personal experience. And Jesus lives among sinners as he lives some 33 years on the earth. He observes their sins. He knows their sins. But he himself knew no sin. It was beyond his personal experience. And that, beloved, intensified the sufferings and misery of Jesus Christ. Imagine a perfectly holy person who knows no sin now having to live in the midst of a wicked and sinful world. Imagine a child an innocent child, we might say, taken from his Christian home and placed into a home full of blasphemies and cursings and swearings, a home of unbelievers and wicked people. That would be, you might say, a shock to that child's system. Well, here we have the perfect Son of God who lived in heavenly glory, living among sinners. He knew no sin. He was offended by their sins. He was grieved by their sins. But he himself knew no sin. Like Lot. Although Lot, of course, did this to himself. This was self-inflicted and wicked of Lot, but Lot lived among the men of Sodom. And we read about Lot in 2 Peter 2, verse 7, that he vexed his righteous soul. His righteous soul was vexed with the filthy conversation of the wicked. And imagine the vexation of Christ's 
righteous soul as he lived among ungodly people and even among his disciples who were guilty of many, many sins. So Jesus knew no sin in the sense that sin was completely beyond his personal experience. And the Bible also speaks of knowing in terms of knowing with affection and love. Jesus knew no sin also in that sense. Knowing with affection and love. Jesus had no affection for sin. He abhorred it. Jesus had no attraction to sin. He detested it. Jesus had no delight in sin. He hated it. Never had a sinful desire. Never had a sinful motive. His whole being, his person, his body, his soul, his mind, his will, he knew no sin. And the apostle emphasizes this because we must know this so that we have confidence that Jesus was perfectly qualified to be the one who bore our sin, to make full payment to God's justice for our sin. Here is one who knew no sin, and yet he loved and loves sinners. And here is one who knew no sin, and yet he saved us from our sin, and is perfectly qualified to do so because of his personal sinlessness. And then by contrast, of course, we no sin. He knew no sin, but we, we know, we know sin. We're the opposite of Jesus in this respect. As to its nature and practice, sin is not at all foreign to us. It ought to be, but it's not. In fact, sin is natural to us. Our first impulse, as it were, as we encounter any situation in life, our first thought is sin. Sin. I will respond to this by sinning. That's the way we are. Lying and cheating and stealing and killing and hating, these, come, these things come naturally to us. They're part of who we are. We know sin. We are experts in sin. We are conceived and born in sin. We sinned from the beginning. Our nature is sinful and corrupt. We taste sin, and we're not at all appalled by that sin as we ought to be. In fact, we love sin at times, and our sorrow over our sin is not as deep as it should be either. We know sin. Here then are two parties in the text. One is Jesus. He knew no sin. And the other, that's us. We know sin. Now something happened to this sinless Jesus. Something happened to this Jesus who knew no sin. This Jesus who has no experience of sin. Something happened to him. And that thing is so shocking that if it were not in the Bible, we would not dare to say it. He was made to be sin. For he, God, hath made him, Jesus, to be sin for us. Now, what does that mean? Well, let's begin with what that does not mean. It does not mean in the first place that God forced or compelled or tempted the holy Jesus to commit sin. 
So Jesus does not say, God my Father made me sin. He caused me to sin. He tempted me to sin. He forced me to sin. That's not, of course, what it means. James 1.13 says, Let no man say when he is tempted, I am tempted of God, for God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempteth he any man. So God is holy, and Jesus is holy, and neither of them can commit sin, and God cannot tempt anyone to commit sin either. Second, it does not mean that God made Jesus sinful so that Jesus began to have wicked thoughts or to speak wicked words or to commit wicked deeds. It's not that he knew no sin and then later on he now knows sin and becomes sinful. He did not become a sinner a murderer, or a thief, or an adulterer, or an idolater, or a blasphemer. When he was made sin, as the text explains it, he remained holy and righteous. He was made sin, but not made a sinner. That's the negative Positively, what does it mean? Well, the idea here, beloved, is legal. Jesus, who knew no sin, was made legally to be sin. God then constituted Jesus as guilty before him. So that Jesus now, because of what God has done, appears before God not personally guilty because he did not commit any sins of his own, but guilty as a representative or substitute for others. This happened when God imputed guilt to him. And then Jesus, because guilt has been imputed to him, becomes liable to punishment for all of those sins which were imputed to him. And that means then that Jesus was made guilty. Guilty before God, although he is holy and righteous and does not know sin, he was made to be guilty before God, as God imputed to him our sins. For he hath made him to be sin for us. Now try to imagine that. God reckoned to the account of Jesus sins which he did not know. Sins which he did not commit. Sins which he repudiated, abhorred, and detested. And God then said to his son, You, my son, are now guilty before me. Your sin, as it were, before me. And that means that Jesus was guilty of Noah's drunkenness, although he himself was never drunk. And Jesus was guilty of David's adultery, although Jesus himself was always pure and holy. And Jesus was guilty of Solomon's idolatry, although Jesus Christ always abhorred idols. And Jesus was guilty of the greed and theft of Zacchaeus, although Jesus never was covetous. And Jesus was guilty of the sins of the Corinthians, 
And look at the list of them in 1 Corinthians 6, for example. Guilty of fornication, idolatry, adultery, sodomy, theft, covetousness, drunkenness, reviling, and extortion. Although he himself knew no sin, abhorred those sins, and detested those sins with the whole of his being. And Jesus was made guilty of our sins too. Think of all the sins of which you are guilty, which you have committed, all the sins in your life so far that you have committed, and all the sins that you will in this lifetime commit, and all the sins that come from your wicked, sinful nature, all of them, Jesus was made guilty of all of them, even though he did not commit any of them, and even though he abhors and detests all of them, and even though he does not know any of them, he was made sin for us. And having been made sin for us, he was punished for all of those sins. That's what guilt means after all. Guilt means liability to punishment. When someone appears before a judge and has his trial and is found to be guilty before that judge, the next thing on the agenda is sentencing, which means what punishment will be inflicted upon this person. Will it be a fine? Will it be imprisonment? Will it even be the death penalty? Well, the punishment for sin, as we know, is death. So having been made sin for us in our place, Jesus is the object of God's wrath and curse. Jesus is cut off from God's fellowship and favor. Jesus is cast out into outer darkness, suffering in his body and soul the wrath of God. And that happened to him as he especially suffered on the cross at the end of his life, was plunged into darkness, and was forsaken of his God and Father at the cross. He knew no sin, He had no acquaintance with sin. He had no affection for sin. And yet he was made guilty of our sin and punished accordingly in our place. That's the first part of the great exchange. Our sins imputed to Jesus. He was made sin for us. And the second part of that great exchange is also described in verse 21, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Jesus is sinless. He was made to be sin. We are sinful. We were made the righteousness of God. God. God's righteousness, God's own righteousness, is his absolute commitment to himself as the only perfect standard. When you think of righteousness, think of a standard, a measuring line, as it were. Do you measure up to God's standard? That's the question in righteousness. And as the righteous God, God is righteous. Everything God is and does is righteous, is in perfect harmony with himself as the 
standard. We are not righteous. We are twisted and perverse. We deviate from that standard. We are, by nature, totally depraved. And even as believers who are holy, our best works are defiled and corrupted with sin so that our works cannot be the whole or part of our righteousness before God. And here then is the gospel that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Christ is made to be sin for us. We saw that was a legal transaction, that our sin was imputed to him. We are made righteousness in him. That also is a legal transaction. That means we do not become personally righteous. That's not the meaning of this text, that we become personally righteous so that in our character and behavior, we become as righteous as God is righteous. It's not here an improvement in our character, a moral or ethical improvement in our condition, which the apostle has in mind. That would be sanctification. But here is a change in our legal position or status before God. This is justification. Not sanctification, but justification. And so the righteousness of God is imputed to us. The obedience of Jesus Christ is imputed to us so that God views us from a legal point of view as one who has never had nor committed any sin, as one who has fulfilled all the righteous requirements of God's law. And as God sees us, by virtue of this justification, as God sees us, we are as righteous as God himself. Christ became guilty. He became sin for us. We are declared righteous, as righteous as God himself. Our state, our legal position is changed by virtue of what Jesus Christ did for us on the cross. And this happens, says the apostle, for us, for our benefit, for our advantage. And this happens in Jesus Christ. The text says, he hath made him to be sin for us. And for there means for our advantage or for our benefit. Now, obviously, Jesus Christ was not made sin for his own advantage or his own benefit, because being made sin brought unspeakable misery upon him. It happened for us. And that's because he was our substitute. He was made sin for us, and he was punished in our place so that we would be spared the punishment that we deserved. He was made the object of God's wrath and curse so that we would not be made the object of God's wrath and curse. His body was broken. His blood was shed, as we see pictured to us in the Lord's Supper, so that we would go unpunished. We deserve punishment. We deserve to be plunged into hell itself. He took that punishment upon himself. 
And this benefit comes to us because we are in him. That we might be made the righteousness of God in him. And those two words, in him, describe our connection, our relationship to Jesus Christ. We are in him. We're in him eternally. We were chosen in him before the foundation of the world. That's election. We were in him at the cross. When he died for us, we were in him. He was representing us at that cross. That's redemption. We're in him now by the work of the Spirit who unites us as a branch is connected to the vine. He is the source then of all of our blessedness. He gives us his own righteousness. He gives us everlasting life. He gives us peace and joy and all the riches of salvation in him. That then, beloved, is the wonder, the wonder of our salvation. Jesus Christ, the sinless Son, who knew no sin, to whom sin was utterly foreign, who had no affection or delight in sin, he was made to be sin for us. We who are sinners and unrighteous, that he, that we, might be made the righteousness of God in him. Amen. Our Father in heaven, what a glorious gospel thou hast given to us, that thy Son, who knew no sin, was made to be sin for us. And we who are sinners are now the righteousness of God in him. We thank thee for that gospel. We thank thee for that truth. We thank thee too that that is pictured in the Lord's Supper. And now we pray, prepare our hearts to receive the sacrament of his body and blood for Christ's sake. Amen. We turn in the back of the Psalter, uh, page 91, to the form for the administration of the Lord's Supper. And the consistory has given permission to Austin and Elizabeth Van Putten to partake with us this morning. We begin reading in the back of the Psalter, page 91. Beloved in the Lord Jesus Christ, attend to the words of the institution of the Holy Supper of our Lord Jesus Christ, as they are delivered by the Holy Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians eleven twenty three through 29. For I have received of the Lord that which also I delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat. This is my body which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. After the same manner also he took the cup, when he had supped, saying, this cup is the New Testament in my blood. This do ye, as oft as ye drink it, in remembrance of me. For as often as ye eat this bread and drink this cup, ye do show the Lord's death till he come. 
Wherefore, whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily shall be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. For he that eateth and drinketh unworthily eateth and drinketh damnation to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. That we may now celebrate the supper of the Lord to our comfort, it is above all things necessary, first, rightly to examine ourselves, secondly, to direct it to that end for which Christ hath ordained and instituted the same, namely, to his remembrance. The true examination of ourselves consists of these three parts. First, that every one consider by himself his sins and the curse due to him for them, to the end that he may abhor and humble himself before God, considering that the wrath of God against sin is so great that rather than it should go unpunished, he hath punished the same in his beloved Son, Jesus Christ, with the bitter and shameful death of the cross. Secondly, that every one examine his own heart, whether he doth believe this faithful promise of God, that all his sins are forgiven him only for the sake of the passion and death of Jesus Christ, and that the perfect righteousness of Christ is imputed and freely given him as his own, yea, so perfectly as if he had had satisfied in his own person for all his sins and fulfilled all righteousness. Thirdly, that every one examine his own conscience, whether he purposeth henceforth to show true thankfulness to God in his whole life and to walk uprightly before him, as also whether he hath laid aside unfeignedly all enmity, hatred, and envy, and doth firmly resolve henceforward to walk in true love and peace with his neighbor. All those then who are thus disposed, God will certainly receive in mercy and count them worthy partakers of the table of his Son, Jesus Christ. The command of Christ and the Apostle Paul admonish all those who are defiled with the following sins to keep themselves from the table of the Lord and declare to them that they have no part in the kingdom of Christ, such as all idolaters, all those who invoke deceased saints, angels, or other creatures, all those who worship images, all enchanters, diviners, charmers, and those who confide in such enchantments, all despisers of God and of his word and of the holy sacraments, all blasphemers, all those who are given to raise discord, sects, and mutiny in church or state, all perjured persons, all those who are disobedient to their parents and superiors, all murderers, contentious persons, and those who live in hatred and envy against their neighbors, all adulterers, whoremongers, drunkards, thieves, usurers, robbers, gamesters, covetous, and all who lead offensive lives. All these, while they continue in such sins, shall abstain from this meat which Christ hath ordained only for the faithful, lest their judgment and condemnation be made the heavier. But this is not designed dearly beloved brethren and sisters in the Lord, to deject the contrite hearts of the faithful, as if none might come to the supper of the Lord but those who are without sin. For we do not come to this supper to testify thereby 
that we are perfect and righteous in ourselves, but on the contrary, considering that we seek our life out of ourselves in Jesus Christ, we acknowledge that we lie in the midst of death. Therefore, notwithstanding, we feel many infirmities and miseries in ourselves, as namely that we have not perfect faith, and that we do not give ourselves to serve God with that zeal as we are bound, but have daily to strive with the weakness of our faith and the evil lusts of our flesh. Yet, since we are by the grace of the Holy Spirit sorry for these weaknesses and earnestly desirous to fight against our unbelief and to live according to all the commandments of God, Therefore, we rest assured that no sin or infirmity which still remaineth against our will in us can hinder us from being received of God in mercy and from being made worthy partakers of this heavenly meat and drink. Let us now also consider to what end the Lord hath instituted his supper, namely, that we do it in remembrance of him. Now after this manner are we to remember him by it. First, that we are confidently persuaded in our hearts that our Lord Jesus Christ, according to the promises made to our forefathers in the Old Testament, was sent of the Father into the world, that he assumed our flesh and blood, that he bore for us the wrath of God, under which we should have perished everlastingly from the beginning of his incarnation to the end of his life upon earth, and that he hath fulfilled for us all obedience to the divine law and righteousness especially when the weight of our sins and the wrath of God pressed out of him the bloody sweat in the garden, where he was bound that we might be freed from our sins, that he afterwards suffered innumerable reproaches, that we might never be confounded, that he was innocently condemned to death, that we might be acquitted, at the judgment seat of God, yea, that he suffered his blessed body to be nailed on the cross, that he might fix thereon the handwriting of our sins, and hath also taken upon himself the curse due to us, that he might fill us with his blessings, and hath humbled himself unto the deepest reproach and pains of hell, both in body and soul, on the tree of the cross, when he cried out with a loud voice, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? That we might be accepted of God and never be forsaken of him. And finally, confirmed with his death and shedding of his blood, the new and eternal testament that covenant of grace and reconciliation when he said, it is finished. Secondly, and that we might firmly believe that we belong to this covenant of grace, the Lord Jesus Christ in his last supper took bread, and when he had given thanks, he break it and gave it to his disciples and said, take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you, this do in remembrance of me. In like manner, also after supper he took the cup, gave thanks, and said, Drink ye all of it, this cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you and for many for the remission of sins." This do ye as often as ye drink it in remembrance of me. That is, 
as often as ye eat of this bread and drink of this cup, you shall thereby, as by a sure remembrance and pledge, be admonished and assured of this my hearty love and faithfulness towards you, that whereas ye should otherwise have suffered eternal death, I have given my body to the death of the cross and shed my blood for you, and as certainly feed and nourish your hungry and thirsty souls with my crucified body and shed blood to everlasting life, as this bread is broken before your eyes, and this cup is given to you, and you eat and drink the same with your mouth in remembrance of me. From this institution of the Holy Supper of our Lord Jesus Christ, we see that he directs our faith and trust to his perfect sacrifice once offered on the cross as to the only ground and foundation of our salvation, wherein he is become to our hungry and thirsty souls the true meat and drink of life eternal. For by his death he hath taken away the cause of our eternal death and misery, namely sin, and obtained for us the quickening spirit that we by the same who dwelleth in Christ as in the head and in us as his members might have true communion with him and be made partakers of all his blessings of life eternal, righteousness, and glory. Besides, that we by this same Spirit may also be united as members of one body in true brotherly love, as the holy apostle saith, for we being many are one bread and one body, for we are all partakers of that one bread, for as out of many grains one meal is ground and one bread baked, and out of many berries being pressed together one wine floweth and mixeth itself together, so shall we all, who by a true faith are engrafted into Christ, be all together one body through brotherly love for Christ's sake our beloved Savior, who hath so exceedingly loved us, and not only show this in word, but also in very deed toward one another. Here to assist us, the Almighty God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, through his Holy Spirit. Amen. That we may obtain all this, let us humble ourselves before God, and with true faith implore his grace. O most merciful God and Father, we beseech thee that thou wilt be pleased in this supper in which we celebrate the glorious remembrance of the bitter death of thy beloved Son, Jesus Christ, to work in our hearts through the Holy Spirit that we may daily more and more with true confidence give ourselves up unto thy Son, Jesus Christ, that our afflicted and contrite hearts through the power of the Holy Ghost may be fed and comforted with his true body and blood. Yea, with him, true God and man, that only heavenly bread, and that we may no longer live in our sins, but he in us and we in him, and thus truly be made partakers of the new and everlasting covenant of grace. That we may not doubt, but thou wilt forever be our gracious Father, nevermore imputing our sins unto us, and providing us with all things necessary, as well for the body as the soul, as thy beloved children and heirs. Grant us also thy grace, that we may take up our cross cheerfully, deny ourselves, confess our Savior 
and in all tribulations with uplifted heads, expect our Lord Jesus Christ from heaven, where he will make our mortal bodies like unto his most glorious body and take us unto him in eternity. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Strengthen us also by this holy supper in the Catholic undoubted Christian faith, whereof we make confession with our mouths and hearts, saying, I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only begotten Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day, he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost. I believe in Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. That we may now be fed with the true heavenly bread, Christ Jesus, let us not cleave with our hearts unto the external bread and wine, but lift them up on high in heaven, where Christ Jesus is our advocate at the right hand of his heavenly Father whither all the articles of our faith lead us. Not doubting, but we shall as certainly be fed and refreshed in our souls through the working of the Holy Ghost with his body and blood as we receive the holy bread and wine in remembrance of him. Who hath believed our report, and to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant, and as a root out of a dry ground. He hath no form nor comeliness, and when we shall see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. He is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised, and we esteemed him not. Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God 
and afflicted, but he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. The bread which we break is the communion of the body of Christ. Take, eat, do this in remembrance of him. All we, like sheep, have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way. And the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He is brought as a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before her shearers is dumb, so he openeth not his mouth. He was taken from prison and from judgment, and who shall declare his generation? For he was cut off out of the land of the living. For the transgression of my people was he stricken. And he made his grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death, because he had done no violence, neither was any deceit in his mouth. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He hath put him to grief. When thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed, he shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand." He shall see of the travail of his soul and shall be satisfied. By his knowledge shall my righteous servant justify many, for he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore will I divide him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, and he bear the sin of many and may. The cup of blessing which we bless is the communion of the blood of Jesus Christ. Drink ye all of it in remembrance of
Beloved in the Lord, since the Lord hath now fed our souls at this table, let us therefore jointly praise his holy name with thanksgiving, and everyone say in his heart thus, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me, bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits, who forgiveth all thine iniquities, who healeth all thy diseases, who redeemeth thy life from destruction, who crowneth thee with loving kindness and tender mercies. The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger and plenteous in mercy. He hath not dealt with us after our sins, nor rewarded us according to our iniquities. For as the heaven is high above the earth, so great is his mercy towards them that fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far hath he removed our transgressions from us. Like as a father pitieth his children, so the Lord pitieth them that fear him, who hath not spared his own son, but delivered him up for us all, and given us all things with him. Therefore God commendeth therewith his love toward us, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us, much more than, being now justified in his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his Son, much more, being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. Therefore shall my mouth and heart show forth the praise of the Lord from this time forth forevermore. Amen. Let everyone say with an attentive heart. O Almighty, merciful God and Father, we render thee most humble and hearty thanks that thou hast of thy infinite mercy given us thine only begotten Son for a mediator and a sacrifice for our sins, and to be our meat and drink unto life eternal, and that thou givest us lively faith, whereby we are made partakers of such great benefits. Thou hast also been pleased that thy beloved Son, Jesus Christ, should institute and ordain his holy supper for the confirmation of the same. Grant, we beseech thee, O faithful God and Father, that through the operation of thy Holy Spirit, the commemoration of the death of our Lord Jesus Christ, may tend to the daily increase of our faith and saving fellowship with him through Jesus Christ, thy Son, in whose name we conclude our prayers, saying, Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever. Amen. We sing from Psalter 85. While we sing, the second offering for the benevolent fund shall be taken. Psalter 85, the three stanzas.
grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit abide with you all. Amen.